Hey everyone, happy holidays. I hope you're having a wonderful time with family and friends. And as you can see, I've got this lovely Christmas sweater. I'm just very proud of it. Anyways, let's get into today's climate news. Welcome to the Climate Recap from the Beckosphere Climate Corner, your go-to place for international and US-based climate news. I'm Becky Hogue, a climate communicator. Click that subscribe button and ring the bell icon to stay updated on this very important topic. And let's jump right into today's news. Freezing air and blizzard conditions have traveled down from Siberia to inflict zero degree Fahrenheit temperatures on most of central and eastern US and western Canada. It could set low pressure records in parts of Canada and some meteorologists say that it might be similar to the great blizzard of 1978 that hit the Ohio Valley. But there's still different ways that it could switch up. Some areas will experience temperatures 30 degrees below normal this Christmas weekend. This is because there's an unusually high pressure zone through the Arctic Circle called the Siberian Express that brings cold air all the way down to Florida. That cold air would usually be trapped in Siberia. Terrible timing with it being peak travel time to see loved ones for the holidays. It's also exacerbating growing food insecurity in the US, which will likely just get worse due to higher food prices from supply chain disruptions. This Arctic blast may last until early 2023. Through this freeze, we are bound to hear climate skeptics saying stupid things like, where's your global warming now? I would like to remind you how this storm can exist while 2022 is still projected to be the fourth hottest year on record. That's because the longer term warming trends make winter shorter, but more extreme. As the air warms, it can hold more moisture, which will then come down in one way or another, including in the form of a blizzard. And as the planet gets warmer, the jet streams get weirder because the Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the world. In fact, a 2022 Arctic report card by the American Geophysical Union was just released a few days ago. The 147 scientists from 11 countries confirmed that the wildfire season is starting earlier and rain events are dropping more water than they used to. Seasons up north are starting to blend together. This warming trend for the Arctic is called Arctic amplification. As more ice cover melts, it exposes the darker water underneath, which reduces what's called an albedo effect. The albedo effect is basically when sun's rays bounce back into the atmosphere because they bounce from a lighter surface. So that's happening less now in the Arctic when there's less ice resulting in the Arctic warming up faster than the rest of the world. This year was the Arctic's sixth warmest year on record and its hottest seven years have been the last seven years. As the Arctic thaws faster, it disrupts the jet streams resulting in colder winters in parts of North America, Europe, and Asia. While we can't immediately attribute one event to climate change, we can see generally what the studies say about how more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere impact the frequency and intensity of these events. Then we'll wait a few years for the attribution studies to come out on a particular event to see how climate change actually impacted it. And these attribution studies basically just look at how likely that event would have happened with or without climate change using adjusted computer models. So anyways, if you hear anyone be like, where is this global warming? There's your answer for you. And if you live in the range of this Christmas blizzard, please be careful and stay safe. This is just the latest weird weather that North America has experienced. Last week, a storm came up from the Southwest causing tornadoes and thunder showers in Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma. By the way, studies seem to suggest that the frequency of tornadoes is not increasing, but the size of the tornado zones is expanding. So if you wanted to learn more about tornado uh, and climate change research, there's a link down below that you can check out. But it's interesting how many tornadoes that Texas in particular recently saw because the tornado season is usually in the spring. And just to finish up with American extreme weather news, Southern California declared itself in a drought emergency last week. The region will likely enter its fourth consecutive dry year. The Metropolitan Water District chairwoman had this to say in a recent statement, quote, conditions in the Colorado River are growing increasingly dire. We simply cannot continue turning to that source to make up the difference in our limited state supplies. In addition, three years of California drought are drawing down our local storage. 
So I'm not getting the blizzard over in California, but we got other issues. <laughs> And in other parts of the world, at least 141 people died in Congo after heavy rainfall and subsequent flooding and landslides hit the country's capital last week. There's been many devastating weather events in West and Central Africa this year, mainly due to the rare triple La Nina, climate change, and hasty urban development to keep up with the population increase. Nearly 40,000 households were flooded by this most recent event. And the Met Office in the UK predicts that 2023 will be an even hotter year than 2022. That's probably the last thing that folks in the UK want to hear after the deadly hot summer this year. Okay, I'll pass these stories off to you now. Are you living in any of these mentioned regions? Let me know what y'all are thinking about these news points down in the comment section below. HSBC, Europe's biggest bank, announced that it would no longer financially support new oil and gas projects. This is a big deal because private financial institutions have a large role to play in switching funds away from polluting industries. HSBC has loaned $111 billion in finance to oil and gas companies since the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, making it the second largest European lender for that industry. This announcement is the result of international and scientific bodies providing analysis to the financial institution in conjunction Conjunction with mass climate protests in the last few years. The bank said it will still support existing fossil fuel projects if they line up with the eventual reduction of fossil fuel use over time. Climate activists say this should be an example for other large banks around the world, particularly in the U.S. The Rainforest Action Network has found again and again that the top four banks are responsible for a quarter of fossil fuel financing committed over the last four years. Those are J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and Citi bank. What do you think of HSBC's move? Let me know in the comment section below. Despite an influx of clean energy this year, the International Energy Agency, or IEA, released a report recently showing that this year is also an all-time high for global coal consumption, beating the previous record set all the way back in 2013. <laughs> coal is still the largest electricity source in the world. Both the clean energy and coal increases are likely due to Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, which forced countries around the world, particularly in Europe, to switch away from Russian fossil fuels. This was exacerbated by the summer drought in Europe, which reduced hydropower output. There have also been issues with nuclear plant shutdowns in countries like France. All these reasons have led countries to start their coal facilities or even build new ones. The IEA warns that this spike in coal use could last for years if decarbonization steps aren't taken now. The biggest increase in coal use is in India, which increased coal use by 7%, the European Union, which increased it by 6%, and China, which increased it by 0.4%. Hey everyone, Editing Becky here. I realized I missed in my explanation of why coal increased so much this year, India. India was also impacted by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. They did decrease how much gas they were getting and in exchange, they replaced a lot of the demand with coal and with solar. A decent amount actually went to solar. Solar rose quite a bit this year, but coal is still very much the largest energy source for this gigantic country. So just simply with the increase in demand and the way that India's energy sector is currently structured, coal has been prioritized for this energy demand growth. To help bring up the mood a little bit though, remember that in the last episode, we did talk about how renewables will likely surpass coal as the main electricity source by early 2025. So there's something to look forward to. This video is sponsored by me, as they all are. <laughs> The most recent news I would say having to do with my other platforms because I have, you know, an Instagram, a TikTok, and a Twitch, and a podcast, which you can check out all the links for down below. But the most recent news is that I tried actually editing down one of my Twitch streams. It was the last Friday Twitch stream, and I talked about a lot of interesting policy decisions, and then I also did react to some Fox News and Ben Shapiro. So I edited those down, and I put them up on the second channel. If you want to watch some Twitch stream content that's not three hours long, then check out those videos. I don't know, I thought they were fun and I am hoping to edit more of those Twitch streams in the future because it makes for pretty easy second content and I don't know, I like them. So anyways, back to your regularly scheduled program. 
Last week, the European Union struck a deal to update its emissions trading system, or ETS, in a big way. The ETS is where companies trade carbon credits to pay for emitting. It's been updated many times, most noticeably last year to reduce the EU's emissions by 55% by 2030. One of the main updates for this time is that the EU is requiring all money made through the carbon market to be used towards climate action. Though, because gas is considered a transition fuel in the EU, spending on gas infrastructure might still count as taking climate action, as suggested by the Modernization Fund, which still allows its money to be used for gas infrastructure. This fund allocates money to help the 10 lowest income EU countries decarbonize. This new update expanded the system to include shipping, road transportation and buildings because originally only industry and energy sectors were involved in the scheme. Probably the biggest part of the emissions trading systems update is that it will soon include a carbon border adjustment mechanism in exchange for providing carbon credit freebies to industries. Both of these are methods of keeping imported goods from undercutting domestic products while domestic industries have to adhere to higher emission standards. It's thought that the tariff method would reduce emissions faster as all the freebies industry gets makes it really slow to reduce emissions compared to like the energy sector. This tariff will impact everything from steel to fertilizer to electricity, including hydrogen production. Companies importing those goods to the EU will be required to buy certificates to cover their embedded CO2 emissions. This import scheme will come into effect starting in October 1st, 2023, but there will be transition time for the importing companies to adjust. It also gives quite a lot of time for domestic industries to adjust to, and that's where the first main problem lies. These free carbon credits are set to start expiring when this new tariff goes into effect, but the Carbon Market Watch says over half of these freebies won't be out of the system by 2030, with the full phase out not being until 2035. The EU is also giving import countries with similar climate goals an out. The EU suggested that the US companies will likely not be impacted by this level thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act. Many countries in Eastern Europe and Africa will be impacted by this tariff though. Wealthier countries like Ukraine and Turkey have begun to create their own carbon markets in an effort to avoid the tax. So it seems like this tariff will mainly be impacting developing nations like leaders from South Africa, China, India, and Brazil warned would happen at the UN Climate Conference COP27 that took place in Egypt last month. If you wanna learn more about that conference, check out the two videos that I did in the cards. Now, this could encourage countries to up their climate goals and create their own markets, like in the case of Ukraine and Turkey. But allowing places like the US to skirt this tariff despite being the historical top emitter feels a little unbalanced to me personally. What do you think of this ETS update? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. The California Public Utilities Commission unanimously voted to lower compensation for homeowners with rooftop solar that give their excess energy to the grid. This compensation is called net metering and it's been debated in many states. Florida's Governor DeSantis surprised a lot of folks by vetoing a similar anti-net metering bill earlier this year. On the one hand, you have utility companies who argue that when people put more rooftop solar on their homes, they essentially remove themselves from the grid, increasing the cost of utility provided electricity for their neighbors. People who have gotten solar so far are more likely to be wealthier and wider, bringing up an equity discussion. But rooftop solar advocates, which includes most of clean energy advocate groups, argues that utility companies just don't want to lose customers, yet pass on the cost of subsidies to remaining customers, hypothetically causing the problem that they're complaining about. Instead, the advocates support providing more income-based subsidies, so rooftop solar is more accessible for everyone. Adding rooftop solar reduces energy costs over time for households and increases a regional grid's resilience to power outage events. So let me know where you land in this discussion. The 1.5 million households in California that already have solar installed will continue to receive the previous amount of compensation, but this will likely reduce demand for rooftop solar in the state moving forward because now placing panels on homes doesn't pay back homeowners as fast. The energy research firm Wood McKenzie sees this decision as cutting California's solar energy market in half by 2024. This would be a giant leap away from the sunny state's goal of running on 100% renewable energy by 2045. The state director of environment in California had this to say about the decision. 
quote, this misguided decision, which undervalues solar's numerous benefits for all Californians, will dim the lights on the growth of solar in the Golden State. Now it's time for a fun fact about Rue. Rue loves to listen to my brother play guitar. It's really cute. He literally comes up and just like insists on lying down next to him. And that was a fun fact about Rue. Obviously, as a climate news provider, I need to talk about nuclear fusion breakthroughs. I'm going to try to be pretty quick on this explanation, though, because I feel like this has already been talked about to death. But nuclear fusion occurs when two atoms are pressed together using high heat and pressure that then forms a new atom. Energy comes from this force interaction, and this is the same reaction that takes place in our sun. Nuclear fusion is the opposite of nuclear fission, which is how current nuclear reactors create power. In nuclear fission reactions, atoms are ripped away from each other, which produces nuclear waste. On Earth, scientists use lasers or magnetism to create a nuclear fusion reaction. In the case of this historic experiment, researchers from the National Ignitions Facility at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California used 192 lasers to get a pellet of deuterium and tritium fuel to produce helium. On December 5th, they achieved what scientists have been working on for 80 years. Ignition. In other words, the reaction produced more energy than it required to make a nuclear fusion reaction happen. Two megajoules in, three megajoules out. This is an amazing achievement for the scientific community, but does it mean anything for our clean energy options? No, <laughs> not really. This reaction needs to be able to be done with regularity. The energy produced needs to be captured and all of this technology needs to be made cheap enough to be adopted to the real world use. This technological development will probably take many more decades to achieve for a regular use purpose. Now there are other methods of creating nuclear fusion that might see breakthrough faster. Many put their faith in a different nuclear fusion reactor called a Tokamak, which uses magnetism to combine a cloud of plasma with the help of extremely high heat. There's one of these reactors called a SPARC, which stands for Soonest or Smallest Private Funded Affordable Robust Compact Reactor, which is being developed by scientists at MIT and a spin-off company, Commonwealth Fusion Systems. They announced at the beginning of this year that they want to have one of these reactors up and running by 2025. But this will be the first time a fusion reaction is completed using plasma, which would be another big scientific breakthrough announcement, but this doesn't necessarily mean that fusion is close enough to be our climate savior. It's important to remember that we have a timeline to hit. While it would be nice to wait for the perfect energy source, we need to significantly decarbonize our energy supplies by 2050 to avoid the worst climate change projections. Luckily, we have solar, wind, nuclear, geothermal, hydropower, and other low carbon forms of energy to choose from. So so we can use those forms of energy and hey, if we got this one in the future, that's great, but we're not relying on it right now. <laughs> and that was your climate recap for the day. If you want more news, there's a whole honorable mentions sub list on my main source list linked below. Remember to talk about the climate crisis every single day and to support your local news organizations. Thank you so much to the people on Patreon who help support me and my fur baby Rue. A special shout out to the climate confident and courageous David H, Norman Anal, Greg H, Paul B, Phil Plasma, Dan Morton, Dane Chris, Nate, Specker, Bree C, Climate Teacher John J, Deanne, and Steve. I greatly appreciate your support of $5 or more. If you would like to support the Becca Sphere, please check out the Patreon and buy me a coffee. Links in the description below for recurring or one-time payments. Happy holidays! <laughs>